Hi guys, Zed here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm gonna show you how to put your creativity to work and maybe teach you a few tricks. So stay tuned and I promise I shall tickle your brain. Today's project is based on a Nixie clock. For those who don't know what a Nixie tube is, well, let's say it's the sophisticated grandpa of the LED. It's much more expensive than the LED and way less versatile, but guess what? It looks kick-ass. If you're in for old school stuff, have I got a project for you. We will combine old school with new school. Nixie tubes with 3D printing. These clocks usually come in as bundles and you can also purchase a blend case to go with it. But no, that's not how we do it here. We're gonna try and throw some blink at it. Well, I've never done one myself so far, so we're gonna be able to tackle all potential roadblocks together. We're here to learn stuff, so as long as you understand the workflow, you will be able to use this set of skills to build much more complicated and interesting stuff. The project will have four phases. One, putting the clock together. This will involve a little bit of patience and the use of a solder iron. Two, designing the case using CAD software. I shall give you some tips to make this process easier. Three, building the housing, in this case, 3D printing it. Four, assembling the whole lot together and showcasing it to your friends saying, I made this. Without further ado, let's get started with phase one. You can purchase these clocks as kits which require assembly. My kit was supplied with a box full of electronic components, two PCBs, four tubes and most important, schematics. I would like to speak to you briefly about the resources you're going to need for this project. The tools we are going to be using are quite basic. We are going to be using a solder iron, alcohol, solder, tweezers, cotton pads and a magnifier. The magnifier, cotton pads and the alcohol are only optional. Isopropyl alcohol would be used to clean the Nixie tubes from accidental fingerprints. Touching them directly will cause the glass to get oily. These oils, which are barely perceivable to the eye, will enable the tube glass to heat unevenly due to its incandescent nature. This might result in cracks or premature burnout. The cleaning step is optional as on this instance the operating temperature never exceeds 40 degrees. Sure, this is not going to be a breeze for some, but as already mentioned, we're here to learn together. Should you have any questions about specific techniques I used, make sure you leave a comment down below and I'll try to answer best of my knowledge. This is not a soldering tutorial, so I will be showing the build on fast forward, but I will be stopping each time I have a comment to make. This is going to be a very interesting little project, so buckle up and let's get started. As you can see, I got to the point where I have to solder the resistors. It's always a good idea to double check if you're using the right ones. There's two options. Number one is measure them if you have a multimeter in hand. Number two, you can use the website I have left in the comments to identify them. The process is easy. They are marked with several colored bars, which once you fill them on the website, it will show you their value. Let's see if we've done a good job. 
it's judgment day and it works oh my didn't expect that these tubes need high currents to power up so be very careful where you place your fingers I've left the following moment to show you what can happen if you don't pay attention there you go that hurt not enough to leave a scar but fortunately only my ego was bruised The next action is very important. For maximum accuracy and best fitment, I recommend doing some packaging checks. In the automotive industry, which also happens to be my background, by packaging we mean taking the assembly, in this case the Nixie clock, and check it against our submarine to see if it fits. The most accurate way to do so is making a very basic 3D model of the Nixie clock. You can use any measurement tools you have handy, like a ruler, but best results would be achievable by using a caliper. A cheap one should do the trick. Once you have all the measurements, we proceed with knocking off the model. This phase will be on fast forward as it was very time consuming and quite specific to the piece of software I've used. It must have taken me 6 hours plus because there was a lot of details to cover and a lot of issues to deal with. Don't get put off by having to do CAD work. This is something anyone can learn, especially these days when you've got so many materials out there available for you. You are going to see how I've started by building the 3D model of the clock itself first. This was used to perform the package checks I've told you about earlier. All the dimensions were taken in the previous step. But to make sure that everything is going to go smooth, I shall provide you this drawing I made. Now, when you first look at these tubes, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Go on, I'll wait. I personally believe that these look like portholes from a submarine. Call me uncrazy, but this is what I think. So then the real question pops. Why don't we pay a tribute to our fellow Beatles and build a yellow submarine? A short disclaimer, this video is not going to be about building a submarine from scratch. What we're going to do is find a nice model that suits our needs and adapt it around our Nixie clock. Because we'll have to print all this with an affordable 3D printer, the task will prove itself even more challenging. First, we have to find the right model. After spending many hours on my usual websites, I managed to find this. It should suit our needs to a certain extent, and if it doesn't, I'm cool with getting dirty with it. By that, I mean tweaking some of the geometries, or even scale some of the features. Before starting altering the model, it is imperative we check it against the 3D model we've generated earlier. This should be a good pointer to tell us if the PCB we've built earlier is going to fit inside snug or it needs more work. When I aligned the clock to the submarine, it was clear that some of the parts of the submarine needed modding to fit. Unfortunately, this is not an easy fix, but I've got a few tricks up my sleeve to make this work. First, we scale the submarine so that the clock sits comfortable inside. Next, we can observe that some of the features are in the way. No problem, we're just gonna have to split them from the model and move them around. Next, I've built some sort of a fascia around the tubes to blend them with the model and to make them look like they're from the same story. The pedestal we had was a little bit small and due to our added weight, the model was now unbalanced. Easy enough, I've just deleted the old one and added a new one, which was longer and provided a bigger contact area. There was something off with the front end, so I wanted to tidy it up a little bit. I'm sure this was just a personal preference, but I think it actually looks a little bit better now. To call it a nose job if you wish. This one was one of the most important but straightforward jobs. Coring out the model and having constant wall thicknesses will allow us to optimize the filament we will be using. This is always a time consuming and fiddly step, but if you get this right, it will save you a massive amount of time further down the line. Next, I had to detach the top side which holds the periscope. Because the way I've chose to split up the model, that will be a separate piece on its own. After coring out the model, 
we can check to see if there's any internal clashes between the Nixie clock and the internal shell of the submarine. In this instance, I had to clear one of the PCB corners and build some features to try and hide the hole I've put in to keep away from the electronics. On the back of the submarine, I had to do some drastic changes to be able to implement the power connector. This meant building two platforms, one for the connector itself and the other one for some hook features. The hooks are supposed to be retention elements for the cable, not only to prevent you from pulling the cable out, but also to allow the cable to sit relax, rather than in tension. This was only an optional step, but I thought it was way worth it. Not only because it does the job, but it also gives you a sense of accomplishment for getting your hands dirty with a little bit of engineering. This is how it all starts really, making things foolproof and failproof. This is the secret recipe of designing good products. Thinking about potential issues or fails before they even happen. Next, I've proceeded with splitting the case in four. I've separated the front end, the rear end and what was left in the middle in another two separate bits. This was already taking me a lot of hours and I didn't want to go overkill with the assembly method. I chose to go with the tongue and groove fit. I know it's not ideal, but think about it. The front end and the rear end never have to be disassembled, provided you have to carry out some service to the clock unit. This means we can glue them in place permanently. Bear with me, it will make more sense when you're going to see the end result in the assembly phase. Clock unit is fixed into position by using four M3 screws. I've also designed some spacers to fit in between the two PCBs. It is very important you fit these parts, otherwise when you tighten the M3 screws, the PCBs are going to flex too much, you might potentially crack them. I needed to build the platform to prevent the upper parts from falling in. I realized it was a good opportunity to hide the screws that fixes the two halves of the submarine together. The other two which are used at the bottom, they are hidden underneath the pedestal, which makes them also not visible. I've added some locators to try and center the PCB with the main housing. This is also highly important as this will set the gaps around the tubes. Last piece of the puzzle. As the adjusting buttons were sitting deep inside the shell, there was no way of accessing them. No problem, we're just gonna have to create another two dummy buttons which fit on top of them and they pop through the shell at the top. All done people! I know that in the real world, this submarine would probably sink, but hey, at least it looks cool. We've just reached phase 3 of the project, and that is preparing the model for 3D printing. FDM technology is very cheap these days, which makes it accessible to the masses. For this exercise, we're going to be using yellow filament to spare us from having to paint everything afterwards, although I do think I'm going to make a few tweaks using some paint. Top tip here for achieving the best finishes. Try using a glass bed and place the parts with the visible side down. Works very well with flat surfaces, but it's terrible with irregular geometries. Another good method for top surfaces, again, they would have to be flat, is using the ironing function in Cura. It's always good to try and print without supports, but if you really have to do it, try these settings and see how they work for you. If you've ever experienced corners or whole parts lifting from the print bed, Maybe you should try some of these, especially for 3D prints. Final phase. This is where we validate all our hard work. Will it work or will it go bust? Word of caution here. Whenever you work with PLA or 3D parts in general, make sure you handle them with care. Don't force the parts together. Make sure they have been cleaned from all spurs or leftovers from using supports. Should you encounter slight resistance, make sure you use a needle file and gently file the part until the assembly is snug. I personally have been using these two for years for post-processing and they've worked a treat. And they're quite inexpensive. I think we've done enough talking and it's time to get dirty. Don't think this was all nice and easy. I mean, there was a little bit of trial and error. As you can see, I had a few parts which have been painted or post-processed or even failed prints as you can see this one here.
all done. Did you enjoy it? I think it was a good trip. Let me know down in the comments if you have encountered any issues or have any questions in regards to the workflow I have just shown. Using the same thinking should enable you to create great things. Of course, every project is going to come with its own challenges, but if you use your tools wisely and you do enough research, you should be alright. One last top tip, try and solve everything you can before you do anything else. Avoid as much as you can post-processing, as it's time consuming and it can prove itself expensive if you have to reprint the parts over and over. If you'd like to see more videos like this or want to learn more about CAD design, electronics or 3D printing, make sure you smash the subscribe button. So stay tuned and keep tinkering.